Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Futures webinar series. I'm Ivana, and I'm Education Team Coordinator in BH Futures Foundation. Uh, tonight, we will host a really special guest, uh, Professor Dr. Jelko Ivezic, Professor of Astronomy at the University of Washington and uh, Professor and Scientist at the Rubin Observatory. Um, I would like Professor uh, to explain more about his work and uh, about his career. Uh, thank you so much for being tonight with us. We are so honored to have you here and thank you for supporting uh, Bosnian youth. Thank you, Ivana. Good evening, everyone. Dobre večer. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this observatory, new observatory that we are building in Chile. And because I understand we don't have many astronomers on uh, this call, I will start with some basics. But first, thank you so much. I didn't know about the foundation and was very pleased when I realized what are the goals of this foundation. I think it's extremely important for everyone to always think about young people and what future opportunities we are providing to them. And it's especially important in, in Bosnia where we are still wounded by recent events. And I think the only way forward for Bosnia and Herzegovina to become a prosperous country is to focus on future rather than past. And thank you again for inviting me and for showing me that there are great things happening in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you for, for support, Professor Ria. We, we, we are honored to have you. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Ivana. So I will start with just a few brief words about me, just uh, to give you some rough idea what was my career path until this moment. And then I will start with a gentle introduction. Why do astronomers build new telescopes that are often very expensive? And what do we learn when we look at the night sky? And then once I motivate why we need a new observatory, Rubin Observatory, on which I'm working, then I'll show you some, basically lots of pretty pictures about how we are building this observatory in Chile. And then I will close by connecting to my title, exploring the universe from your armchair, meaning that you don't have to be in Seattle or anywhere else in particular in the world. You can be in Sarajevo and you can access all these data sets that we are preparing both for scientists to use, but also for teachers, for amateur astronomers, for everyone who would be interested in exploring the sky. With modern technology, you can get to all these data, all these images that I will describe to you and do whatever you want with them. It will not be protected, it will be free to everyone, and it, there will be lots of tools designed for teachers, for amateur astronomers, where you don't have to be professional astronomer, but you can enjoy this data that we will collect soon. So I am in Seattle at the University of Washington. I came here in 2004 as professor of astronomy. Seattle is in the upper left corner of United States. So it's not in Washington DC, District of Columbia, which is close to New York, which is capital of United States. It's the state of Washington on the other side of the country. And Seattle is the largest city. You may know Seattle through Microsoft, that's where Microsoft company is. You may know them as Amazon company, that's where Amazon started. We also have Boeing airplanes, that's in Seattle, and many other industries. And the state itself is very beautiful. On the West Coast, it's basically ocean, Pacific Ocean. Then in the middle, there is very high mountain range, and there is picture in the bottom right. There are lots of glaciers. It's a beautiful place to hike during summer, lots of beautiful lakes. And then it's also a great place to ski during winter. So it's in many ways, Washington looks like Bosnia. There are many forests, hills. And then in the east part, there is also desert because those mountains protect the influx of wet air from Pacific. And so the eastern part of the country is agricultural part and it's very dry. It's basically desert climate. So that's where I live now. I grew up in Zagreb. I studied, I got my undergrad degrees in Zagreb. I studied first mechanical engineering and then physics. And then I decided I would really want to 
specialize in astrophysics. And the reason is that I started attending amateur astronomy classes and astronomy club in my elementary school when I was third grade. I fell in love with astronomy when I was 10 years old. And so eventually I said, that's what I want to do. I don't want to do anything else. So I went to Kentucky for graduate studies. And my mom said, sure, you can go. But as soon as you get your PhD, you come back. And that was my intention. But then I fell in love. I met this woman at my graduate studies. And so then I got baby. Then we got dog. And now what was supposed to be four years turned out to be 30 years. But uh, my plan is still, as soon as I finish this observatory and it starts operating regularly, I will start going back to Zagreb more and more and interact with astronomers in the entire region. I have a lot of connections to Slovenia, to Hungary, to astronomers in Belgrade. So I want to go back and use this data to do scientific projects once the observatory is done in about two years. I'm also born in Sarajevo. I was born in Sarajevo. So my father's family comes from Sanski Most. And I also spent a year of my life in Banja Luka many years ago. So I really like Bosnia. And in particular, Sarajevo is very dear to me. These are pictures from a recent trip. I think uh, two years ago, a bunch of my very good friends from Zagreb and I went to Sarajevo and had a great time. It's really great to see how Sarajevo is again becoming a very vibrant city, very welcoming. We really enjoyed visiting lots of museums. Museums are becoming excellent. So great. I love Sarajevo. So back to astronomy. So what do astronomers want to do? These days, there are two big questions. There are many small questions, but there are two big questions. So over the last few decades, the technology improved that we managed to discover planets around other stars. There are eight planets, used to be nine with Pluto in our solar system. And we thought for many decades, for the last hundred years, people thought that maybe that's unique to our solar system. Simply because we could not see planets around other stars because stars are very bright and planets are not, so it's hard to see them. Well, with technology, now we know that there are at least 4,000 other planets that we know exist around other stars. So an obvious question then is, is the life on these planets? Are we alone? And that's what astrobiology focuses on, and it's a fast growing field. Another big question is, why is the universe expanding? That was discovered about 100 years ago by Hubble, after whom Hubble Space Telescope is named. And recently we discovered that that expansion, it's not slowing down as you would expect based on physics, just like you throw a stone above your head, that stone will slow down and come back to you because of gravity. But on the contrary to this expectation, the universe is actually accelerating the expansion of the universe. And we don't know exactly how to explain that from first principles of physics. You can explain it if you add one term to equations that describe that motion called dark energy. And that's basically just a name to hide our lack of knowledge, but we don't really know what is dark energy. There is an alternative explanation that maybe Einstein's general theory of relativity that describes the behavior of gravity on astronomical scales, that maybe it needs to be modified. And the conclusion about the existence of dark energy is wrong. And we don't know which of these two possibilities is less wrong. And we cannot tell it because data are not good enough. So generally speaking, today, astronomy or astrophysics, but not astrology. Astrology is about horoscopes. It's not a science. But in astronomy, basically what we want to study is the formation and evolution of structure in the universe. And that means both life and understanding of the expansion of the universe and many other questions. So before I start talking about my telescope, I will try just to explain what kind of telescopes exist today. What are the three principal directions that we explore when we build new telescopes? So Hubble Space Telescope is probably the most famous telescope in the world. You must have seen pictures there everywhere from the telescope. That telescope is above the atmosphere. It's in orbit. It's essentially a spacecraft. 
And the reason why it's above the atmosphere, which of course is very expensive, it's much cheaper to have telescope on Earth, but you put telescope in atmosphere to avoid atmosphere, which does two bad things. It limits your resolution of your pictures because it blurs the path of light to your telescope. And it also absorbs X-rays, it absorbs infrared radiation. So if you want to observe objects at these wavelengths, and these wavelengths are important because, for example, in X-rays, you can see the evidence of black holes in objects called quasars in infrared you can study what happens with very old stars or how stars are born from cocoons of dust that emit an infrared. So these are important goals, but you can't do them from the ground. So over the last 50 or maybe a little bit more years, we learned how to put telescopes in orbit. And so Hubble is here on the left, and the picture on the right is the core of one big galaxy obtained with Hubble. And you can't see, you can't get such beautiful photographs from the ground. Then there is second type of telescopes where you try to make them as large as you can. The mirror size needs to be as large as you can make because that gives you sensitivity to very faint objects. And that's especially important if you want to get spectra like this one shown on the right, where all these details in that spectrum tell us about chemical composition of the object that we are looking at. If it's a galaxy, it can tell us how far that galaxy is. So basically, this is how we learn about chemistry and physics of objects on the sky by getting their spectra. And this is example of two twin telescopes called Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And the third kind of telescope that just started developing about two decades ago, because only two decades ago, the digital technology developed enough that we could use it in our cameras. So CCD stands for charge coupled device. It's a very similar sensor, not identical, but very similar to what you have in your smartphones. When you make picture with your phone, it's very similar in technology with what we do in astronomy. And so we learn how to make big cameras that can observe many objects at a given time. So with the first two types of telescopes I showed you, typically you would look at a specific object. But with large sky surveys, you just make very wide angle pictures on the sky that, that can typically include millions of objects. And so with modern technology right now, if you ask what is the largest catalog, it contains over a billion astronomical objects, stars and galaxies, quasars, et cetera. And this opens now a new scientific venue for astronomy where we can do very precise statistical studies because we have so many objects. And so this is example of what you see on the sky. This thing in the bottom, that's piece of a picture of full moon that I edit for scale. And so you can now see this is a tiny part of the sky, much smaller than the full moon. And yet there are tens of thousands of objects in this image. And so if you looked by naked eye at the sky, you would see one star on average in about 200 times larger area. So this shows you how with telescopes, we can see so many things that you just can't see with your eye. Your eye can see only about 3000 stars on the sky and that's it. But with modern technology, we now can detect billions of objects and we can measure where they are, how bright they are, what color they are. Colors tell us a lot about these objects. So this is what you would see with such sensitive instrument. And so now to just say a few more words about motivation for my observatory. As I said, we already know universe is expanding. This is plot from a paper about 100 years ago by this guy smoking on the left. That's Edwin Hubble, after whom Hubble Space Telescope is named. He found out this relationship that the further a galaxy is, that's what this diagram shows on the x-axis, that it faster, it moves faster away from us. Its recession speed is higher. And so first you could think that we are in the center of the universe and everybody is running away from us. But as this little analogy in the bottom left with dough for a bread with raisins in it shows, this is wrong conclusion. Basically, if you now look at the dough on the bottom left, take any three raisins, take one to be you, and the other two are some other galaxies. If you now double in size this dough because it's, it's uh, yeast, it's growing, then all these 
distances will double. But then when you calculate what is the speed of recession, do you get exactly this line that Hubble put in this diagram? So this is not proof that we are in the center of the universe. This is more a proof that everyone is moving away from everyone else. There is no special raisin, no special galaxy in this bread. So this is true for any galaxy from which you would do these observations. So he found that the universe is expanded. That was a big discovery at that time. But then about 20 years ago, maybe a little bit more, 30 years ago, we discovered by doing various observations that this expansion is accelerating. And that was a huge surprise because it's exactly the opposite from what we were expecting. And we thought at that time before the discovery that we knew enough physics to explain everything we observed. But this was such a huge surprise because there is no theoretical explanation. We don't understand why the universe is accelerating. And there are two possibilities that are leading our potential explanations today. Either Einstein was wrong with his general relativity theory, and we derived wrong conclusion about the existence of dark energy, or Einstein's theory is correct, but there is this new mysterious constituent of the universe called dark energy. We don't know with present data that we have how to distinguish between these two possibilities, but we also know what kind of data we would need to have to do so, to distinguish them. And that's basically the motivation, the main motivation for Rubin Observatory. So if when astronomers do their analysis, they conclude in order to make the next step in this scientific progress, we need to precisely measure on the sky using images like I just showed you about 10 billion galaxies. Why so many? Because these are very subtle effects. And so to have statistical errors to be small enough to see the differences, you would need that many galaxies. And then there are special types of stars called supernovae that explode. And it's very easy to get their distance. That's why they're important. And so we would also need a few million supernovae to do this measurement. And no telescope on Earth can do that. And so that's why we needed to design new observatory, Rubin Observatory. And what we plan to do first 10 years with it, it's called LSST, Legacy Survey of Space and Time. That's what I'm going to focus on for the rest of my presentation. So basically, what we want to have is a very large telescope, large mirror to see faint objects. But at the same time, we need a much larger field of view. We need to see a much larger piece of sky that you can see with existing telescopes. And so that's what we set out to do. So just to conclude this, this is distribution of galaxies from a preceding survey, Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And the, this is, if you imagine pomegranate, so there is three dimensional distribution of galaxies. Then you take one plane through it. You take knife and cut through pomegranate. And now you look inside pomegranate, Shipak, you see the kernels, and these are galaxies. And there is structure. You can see the structure. So this shows each of these little dots is one galaxy. We are in the center looking in all these directions in that plane. And the point of the diagram is that this is not like randomly distributed points. Like if you took a handful of salt and threw on your table, it would be random points. Here they are clustered. And how exactly they are clustered tells us a lot about the growth of structure and the history of the universe. So what we want to do is to make similar measurements like this line, but we want to extend it in distance much further. And we want to have many more galaxies. That's the goal of the project. There are many other goals too. It's not just cosmology. And I will just show another example. So it's looking for potentially hazardous asteroids. Probably you've seen some movies about like Bruce Willis going to an asteroid and blowing it apart. So this is Hollywood, but indeed in reality, there is a possibility, it's a small probability, but if we cannot rule it out, that there could be an impact within foreseeable time. And indeed it's one in 10,000 probability for next hundred years that could be a collision with asteroid large, at least 100 meter large. And what happens is illustrated at the bottom right, you see this big crater, it's about three kilometers across. That was a 40 meter object that hit this location in Arizona. It's close to Grand Canyon and city Flagstaff. 
About 50,000 years ago, it was an iron object made of pure iron, and it impacted Earth and made this huge crater. And it's only 40 meters. And today, you don't even have to destroy the whole region. The whole world is so connected. The global economy is so sensitive to perturbations that even if you didn't kill many people, you could have major influence on world economy and there could be many hundreds, if not thousands of billions of dollars lost because of such collisions. So we are motivated to find it. And indeed, there is a mandate from US Congress to NASA to find complete catalog, 90% complete of these objects. And at this Rubin Observatory will be the most powerful survey to discover them. And so let me now tell you more about the observatory. So these are the six most exciting new observatories in the world in the context of optical astronomy. The two above, they are actually space telescopes. They fly. They are just like Hubble Space, space Telescope. Indeed, they are, they are successors to Hubble Space Telescope. James Webb Space Telescope will have a larger mirror, while Nancy Grace Roman Telescope will have almost exactly the same mirror as Hubble, but it will have a much larger field of view. And then there are four ground-based observatories that are being built. The one on the left, European Extremely Large Telescope, is 40 meter mirror. It's just mind boggling how large that mirror will be. That's led by European countries. And the two in the middle, 30 meter telescope and giant Magellan telescope, they're slightly smaller. They are led by US consortia, also with international participation. And then my observatory, it looks like the tiniest one. It's also the cheapest one. It's only $1.4 billion. James Webb, for example, is $10 billion, not million, billion. And these are expensive toys. So why is Rubin so important? It's important because it can do something that none of these other telescopes can do. So this is an uh, astronomer who this observatory is named after. Vera Rubin was an astronomer who contributed a lot to discovery of dark matter. So this observatory was named to honor her. Also, Nancy Grace Roman was a woman who worked at NASA, who was very instrumental in many missions. That's what the other telescope is named after. So what is special about Rubin? So it's not the largest mirror, but it is the largest product of the mirror area and the field of view size. Again, that's important because large mirror allows you to see faint objects. Large field of view size allows you to scan the sky rapidly. And that's the main idea behind Rubin Observatory. Quick comparison, field of view, in other words, how big piece of sky you can get in one image is shown on the right. Gemini South is a large telescope, our neighbor. It's a public US telescope sighted in Chile. You can see the tiny circle upright. That's how much Gemini South can see. And Rubin will be able to see 100 times more. So for every picture that Rubin will make, Gemini would have to make 100 pictures, each lasting roughly the same. So we can scan the sky 100 times faster than Gemini. So if you wanted to do Gemini to do what we will do in 10 years, it would take you 1,000 years with Gemini. That's why we need new observatory. And so quickly, this is how optically we managed to solve this technical problem, that we have a large field of view and that the image is still not distorted and enables science. We essentially have three mirrors, not two. So the bottom one is two mirrors in one piece of glass. The outer part, the outer annulus, acts as primary mirror. These blue arrows show how light travels through the system. So it bounces off this mirror on top called secondary. And then unique thing is that we have tertiary mirror in the middle, and then it goes back through these three lenses. And in that hole in the secondary mirror on top, there will be camera that I'll show you later. So that's the technical solution that enabled this Rubin Observatory desire to have large field of view. And so this is the picture of that mirror. It's 8.4 meter across. It was produced in a mirror lab at the University of Arizona. This place is underneath football stadium. And they developed this new technology for making large mirrors by spinning oven. So if you see the red 
edge around the mirror where people are standing on that actually can be lifted up and you put lid on this and then you melt the glass, you spin it, so the top surface becomes parabola that you need for optics, and then you cool it down until it's solid again, and you get almost perfect mirror. And that's the new technology that enabled us to make this mirror for much less money than with old technology. So this is about $30 million to get this mirror. That was gift from Bill Gates and from Charles Simoni, who was the lead of the team that produced Microsoft Office programs. So bottom line is Rubin Observatory wants to make pictures of the sky. We want to get pictures of the entire sky that you can see on any given night, which is about 100 times more than you can do with other telescopes. And then we want to do that for 10 years. That's the goal of the project. And to illustrate to you the change in technology between existing data and what Rubin will get, here is one small example. So this is color image based on three filters like RGB from one of the best existing surveys, SDSS. And this is tiny picture on the sky. This is only one-tenth of the full moon's diameter. It's a tiny piece of sky, but you can see there are lots of objects. Now, SDSS had 2.5 mir meter mirror, we'll have 8.4 meters. So we already have similar telescopes that can do small areas on the sky. That's why I can show you this example, but they cannot do the whole sky. But for this small piece of the sky, that's what will happen. So it's amazing what progress in technology will give us. This is real sky, and these are real objects. You can see that they overlap, but now observe how many more faint objects we get in more sensitive data set. So the better telescope you have, the more objects you see. And so then you measure their positions, their colors, etc. And because there are so many of them that you see, you end up with many tens of billions of objects. Again, this is what we want to get map on the sky. And so here is just a quick example how we write software to process images. So we get raw image coming from the camera, then we have to correct for instrumental effects. And then we teach computers to interpret this image and find individual objects. So you don't do it by hand, by eyes. Computer recognizes objects, measures their positions, measures how much light we received, et cetera. And then we combine it with other data and make astronomical conclusions. So it's a lot of software to write. It's all custom made, but that gives you an idea how to what, what we want to do. So let me now focus on the actual observatory. This shows how data will flow. Observatory is in Chile, in South America. These lines show fiber optical cables that will connect, that will send data to United States. And then it will be processed in California in uh, Slack laboratory that will be data processing center. And then everything will sooner or later go to the web and everybody will be able to access it. So this was the beginning of the, of the construction. So this parking lot essentially is where observatory is now. That's uh, me after I had too much coffee, I was very excited that we are beginning the building. And so now I'll show you 1.5 minutes long movie that will summarize 10 years of building the observatory. So first we had to level the hill so that then we had to make a big hole roughly the size of Olympic swimming pool, fill it with concrete. There were many trucks of concrete coming up the mountain. It's about two hour drive from the nearest large city. And then we started building it. So a Chilean company built the building itself. It's a six floor building at the highest point. And then an Italian company built the dome. And a Spanish company built the telescope in Spain and then we shipped it to Chile. Then of course COVID came and slowed us down. Effectively, we lost two years of construction time due to COVID. The 
So the dome is done. Here we are putting a telescope in with a crane. That was the largest crane in Chile at the time. Let's see. So this is how it looks today. And this is telescope that I mentioned. So it's very unusual telescope. It's very short because we want to be able to move fast from one point on the sky to another one because we want to cover the entire sky. And this is in a factory in Spain where they assembled it. We measured these properties, said that's what we want. Let's move it to Chile. Then they disassembled it. It's of the order 10,000 pieces. And so we shipped all that to Chile and then they reassembled it in Chile. And this is now this telescope inside the dome. So the mirror is still not integrated. That's the goal for this year, but it's already moving under power and there is progress. So in this telescope, we also have camera. That is the largest astronomical camera ever built. It's already in the Guinness Book of Records as the largest camera. It has 3000 megapixels. It's as big as a fairly large car. So this is the lens. So if you go back where this, uh, that's our project manager for the camera and Dean, where she stands in front of camera, there is a big lens. And so this is the actual lens produced. This is the largest lens ever produced. It used to be the one meter lens at Yerkes telescope in, in close to Chicago that was the largest lens in last hundred years. And so this now broke the record. And this is the focal plane. So this is how you get 3000 megapixels. So each of these little squares, that's one sensor, which is 16 megapixels. And so then we have 189 of them connected in this focal plane to produce this count of 3,200 megapixels. So there are so many pixels that if you wanted to display this picture so you can see every detail with your, your eyes, it would not be easy job to do. Your eyes have an angular resolution of one arc minute. And so now if you wanted to magnify this image so that your eyes correspond roughly, your eyes resolution corresponds roughly to pixel size, to see all the information in the image, it would take about 1,500 high definition televisions to display that image. So this is of course PowerPoint picture. So you would have to take so many TVs that you could cover the whole wall of a giant building. And then you could see all the detail or if you were interested in watching a movie of this data set. So you connect pictures of the same part on the sky then you have 30 frames per second and you can calculate it would take you 11 months to watch the entire data set we will collect. So that's why I call this data set LSST the greatest movie of all time. It would be a year long movie. And so let me now conclude with the last point I want to make. How could you get to this data set? Is it only for us? in the States or for everyone? And the answer is for everyone in the world. And we will be providing tools to do so. And we are not the first project to do so. Like SDSS is the first famous example of project that organized their data in an easy to use form, not only for scientists, but also for amateur astronomers, for teachers in school who would want to teach basic astronomy, et cetera. And so here, this is website that is more than 10 years old from SDSS project and motivated by their success, we are planning similar things for Rubin Observatory. So we have many constituencies that we are addressing. Here's the website if you are interested in further exploring at the bottom of the page. We are now just about to finish this uh, part of the observatory and we will have a lot of tools to visualize images on the sky. There will be very good exercises that teachers can take and without much work adapt for their program that maps onto science studies in either elementary school or high schools. There will be in the bottom right, you can see actually some Python code there will be very good tools in Python that you can take to the next level if you're more advanced user, etc. So here is an example for teachers what you could do. So this will be all public. It's easy to do it because it's running on our computer center. Teachers would not have to download any code, any programs on their local computers. It's all running in our cloud. 
And basically they just need to have web address. And so this is example of one lecture that is trying to explain to students, to, to students, how do we get color images in astronomy? It explains the concept of filters, how you combine them, why do we want to do that? What kind of information you learn about the objects, etc. This is another interesting uh, lecture about hazardous asteroids that I mentioned earlier, those asteroids that could eventually hit Earth. So again, you can uh, go there, there are 30 pages. So students would go through this. There are questions, once they provide correct answers, they advance. And so it's a very nifty thing for teachers. And then you go deeper, you answer questions, you get uh, multiple choice questions, you get some visualization. So it is very efficient way to have astronomy lecture in elementary school or high school. So let me stop here. I'm not even sure how much time uh, we have left, but this is my concluding slide. So the main messages I want to, to have you leave this talk with are that today astronomers are using technology so effectively that we are in the regime of working with billions of objects. So that implies immediately that you need a lot of experts to build such data sets. So in astronomy today, in modern astronomy, it's not just astronomers. We have a lot of physicists, mechanical engineers, electronics engineers, a lot of software engineers. All these specializations are required to build these complex and expensive observatories. And of course, data mining, machine learning that I didn't talk about today, that's actually my research area, they play a huge role today. You can't handle billions of objects by just taking Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. You have to write custom-made code. And so this is opening new era because of technology. It's a different astronomy than we had 20 or 30 years ago. And I hope some of you got puzzled by this, and maybe some of you will explore further if you will get into a situation where you have some questions and you'd like to ask more, please send me email. It's easy to find my email on the web. I would be happy to talk to you. And now I'm open to questions from the audience today. And I think Ivana, it's back to you. Thank you, Professor. It was pleasurable and really, really interesting. Um, presentation. I call everyone to ask question. Uh, you have a comment that it was excellent presentation from Rasim. Thank you yep. so much, uh, Professor Ivesic. Um, someone asked if you're familiar, familiar with um, I know Observatory on Trebevich. Yeah, yeah, Professor, we just before this presentation started, we discussed that. Uh, that you that right. someone confirmed Maida confirmed that um, the observatory will be rebuilt so I don't know much about it but Muhammad Muminovic who was most instrumental in building this observatory is my Facebook friend because when I was a kid in in Yugoslavia and going to astronomical camps then uh, Meho was very active in Sarajevo. They did some excellent work there on this new observatory at Trebevich, and it's called Cholina Kappa. And during the war, it was um, badly damaged. And just recently, I saw Meho's post on Facebook that uh, the deputy mayor of Sarajevo approved some funding to rebuild that observatory. So I was very happy to hear that. But that's the extent of my knowledge. So maybe if you if you Google Cholina Kappa and Muminovic, probably you will find some more material on the web. But something is happening, but I don't know details. I see, what is the temperature range at your site? So the height is 2,800, 2,800 meters. So it's quite high, though not as high altitude as some other observatories that can be as high as 5,000 meters. You need to use oxygen mask when you go to, to such observatories. We can work without oxygen mask, but it is hard. If you go five, five flights of stairs in our observatory, you can feel in your breathing pattern that there is some oxygen missing there. 
So temperature varies, and of course it's colder during night. It can even freeze. So I think extremes are roughly minus five centigrades, maybe minus 10 on a bad night. And then during summer, during the day, it can certainly go to 30 degrees or so, but it's not very extreme. So it's not as bad as some other places. Thank you for your answers, Professor. Uh, I invite everyone that uh, has questions to write. Oh, okay, good question from Adina. If the universe is expanding, where is it expanding into? So we can go back to that analogy with that bread and raisins. So we imagine infinitely large bread. <laughs> I know it's a complex concept because it's infinite, but what we can do is we can observe around the, us but not all the way to infinity. We have limited reach with our observations. And the reason is that the light, when it travels through the universe, it travels at the speed of light, and that's 300,000 kilometers per second. And that sounds like super fast, and indeed it's super fast for compared to speeds we have on Earth. But still, it is finite speed. So we also know that the universe is expanding now. So you can run it backwards in your head or in your computer with equations to a point that we call Big Bang, when there was some explosion. And we can go all the way to almost the beginning of time as we know it, but we don't know what happened before. Actually, even asking question before is not well defined in the context of modern physics. We can go all the way back to just a little bit after this initial point, but we don't really understand the very beginning, the first fraction of a second of what was going on. But the point is, there is this finite amount of time that the universe was expanding from Big Bang until today. That's about 13 billion years. And so now you multiply 30 billion years with that speed, and you will get the maximum distance we can explore. It's almost like, let's say you are in some large country and someone came to you and you know that they were traveling at 100 kilometers per hour and they were traveling for two hours. So that means they traveled 200 kilometers. And so they can tell you anything in the circle around you within 200 kilometers, but they don't have any information about something further than that. And similarly, when we observe in the universe, the furthest we can see is basically the age of the universe times the speed of light. But there is no edge there. It's simply how far at this moment in the history of the universe we can observe given the speed of light. But we think that at least conceptually, the universe is infinitely large. So that bread is infinitely large. So what we are doing is we are observing these nearby raisins and we see that locally bread is rising. And then we just extrapolate to the entire universe that we assume it's infinite. But really behind that horizon that we can explore, we do not know much. It's all uh, assumptions, assertions and theory. Dali. So am I demotivated to look at stars when I know that I'm looking at the past? Well, not really, because actually it's like archeologists, you look at the past and you learn what was happening billion years ago, many billions, all the way to 13 billion years ago. That's actually fortunate that we can see in past because uh, it allows us to get all this evolution of the universe piece together. You can think about, Let's say some aliens, someone comes to Earth to observe what people do. And let's assume they cannot stay long. They can stay only like one second. They can make picture of everything that is going on on Earth, but they are allowed to stay only for one second. So then the question is, that's similar to us in the universe. 
we've been observing universe last hundred years or maybe thousand years, whatever, that's very short to 13 billion years. It's very short compared to billions of years. So it's basically us looking at the universe would be like these aliens coming on earth and staying for one short second. Now, if they stayed for that one second, would they be able to conclude that people live and die, that people are born, that people have finite duration, 100 years, much longer than one second, could they conclude this from this short observation? And the answer is they would, they could, just like we can make conclusions about the universe. And so they would have to observe everything they saw in that one second, but they would see that there are some tiny people and then they would see there are bigger people and that there are some connections between them. They would see often there are two big people and one small person. Then sometimes they would see that there are some people laying flat and many people around them and a hole in the ground. So you, they could make various connections and hopefully conclude that people begin and people end and they have finite duration. That's exactly in analogy with what we learn in astronomy that stars do not live forever. Stars, for example, like our sun are born from a giant cloud of gas and dust and it collapses. And then at the end of that collapse, it becomes so hot in the center that nuclear fusion begins. And that nuclear fusion gives energy that sun emits. That's why it's warm when you go to sunshine. But that conversion of hydrogen into helium inside our sun will not last forever. Our sun is like halfway through its life. Our sun is 5 billion years old, and it will live another 5 billion years, and then it will exhaust its fuel, and then it will be done. It will expand, engulf Earth, and so on. But the point is, it is a finite amount of time. And we know that because we can see actually some stars that were born before our sun that are now in that last phase of their life. We can actually observe dying stars. We also have stars that are just being born. We can see these clouds collapsing. And then we have physics and chemistry to help us understand this. And all these pieces come together and we believe we do have a very good understanding of stellar evolution. For dark energy, we don't know much, but with stellar evolution, it's quite developed theory and we can explain many detailed observations that we see. Question from uh, Rasim, is James Webb replacement for the Hubble telescope? Yes, exactly. There are actually two replacements. So with Hubble, one obvious thing you could improve is to make bigger mirror. The other obvious thing you could do is to make a bigger field of view. So when you make a picture, you see a larger piece of the sky and it's hard to do both at the same time. That's what Rubin does on the ground. Big mirror, big field of view. In space, it's harder. So that's why there are two telescopes that optimize in these two directions. James Webb is like Hubble, but instead of 2.5 meter telescope, uh, mirror, it will have 6.5 meter. So 10 times larger area, while the Roman Space Telescope will have same mirror, but it will have 100 times larger field of view. So in many ways, it's these two new telescopes compared to Hubble Space Telescope, just like Rubin Observatory compares to other ground-based observatories. Except with Rubin, we managed to push both the mirror size up and the field of view size up while in space, because it's much harder and more expensive, we had to do it with two different telescopes. The explanation of the Buddhist void. So basically explanation there is that's not a void, but there is a big chunk of what we call dust. It's solid particles, very similar to dust in your apartment if you haven't cleaned for a while. And that dust is very efficient in absorbing light. So when you see picture of the stars in the sky, if you look towards Milky Way plane, and sometimes you see these big dark holes, they are not actually holes. It's just something in front of all the stars that blocks light from them. And we can't see anything in that direction. And so it looks like a hole. How do we know that? It's quite easy if you change wavelength, if you go to infrared, 
that dust is not so efficient for absorbing light in infrared. So in infrared, you can actually make a picture and see that those areas that look like big dark holes in optical, they do have lots of stars. And they, the better the telescope, the more stars you see. That was answer for Amar. No, that was answer to Zorana. Amar says, will the data from Rubin finally unravel the mystery of dark energy? Yes, that's one of the main goals of Rubin. One of the main justifications why we are spending billion dollars on this observatory. And of course, we designed observatory to deliver a data set that will enable this, but it will take 10 years to collect this data set. So we will have some early answers in a few years from now. Two years from now, maybe two and a half, we, be, we plan to begin taking data. And then it will take a few years to have at least a little bit of data to do science. So maybe five years from now, we will have initial results. And then the final results will be enabled by the end with the full data set, maybe in 12 years or so. Maybe it will take a few more years for analysis. So it's at least a decade to get the final answer from Rubin. Is the evidence more in favor of dark energy or more in favor, favor of having to modify the general theory of relativity? Okay, oh, another question from Arnes. If the dark matter and dark energy are 95% of universe, uh, are they maybe parallel reality or real part of our universe? So we think it's real part of our universe. So the few percent of universe, and now we are talking about the total mass energy content of the universe. So you know Einstein's equation E equals MC square. So energy and mass is equivalent. So when we add up all matter and energy in the universe, then we can ask which part of that is due to dark matter, dark energy, or normal matter, like we are made of protons, neutrons, etc. So what we are made of, it's just a few percent of the universe. And then there are these two other mysterious things, dark matter and dark energy. For dark matter, with dark matter, the situation is somewhat better than with dark energy. So as Vera Rubin and many others showed, dark matter we believe exists because we, op we observe motion of many objects in the universe. And just like when you look at moon going around earth, you can calculate mass of earth from the fact that it takes one month for the moon to go around earth. And if you know distance between these two objects, earth and moon, it's high school physics to calculate what is mass of earth. So when we observe some stars in the universe, we can see that they move in some orbits and we can predict what should be mass that keeps them in that orbit because mass, mass produces gravity. So we know that there is some source of gravity that is very strong. And yet when we look in the images, there are no stars, there is nothing visible. So we call it matter because it produces gravity, which we measure indirectly and then we call it dark because we can't see it and so dark matter is the result of that observation and there are many good theories that could explain what dark matter is in physics there are number of particles elementary particles that are predicted could be explanation for existence of dark matter we don't know which one exactly is correct but at least they are viable theories now with dark energy, the situation is much more confusing. With dark energy, we have two options. If you want to explain all the modern observations in astronomy, going from optical observations like I showed you today, all the way to cosmic microwave background that shows universe is expanding, that was hot ball early in the universe. So if you want to explain all these observations, you have two options. One is to say, we believe Einstein's theory is correct that describes gravity, so theory of relativity. And then you are led to a conclusion that you have to assume there is another constituent of the universe that dominates everything called dark energy. Then everything works, you can explain it, except you have no idea what dark energy is. 
The other option is to say, well, we need to modify theory of relativity, and then we can explain observations without dark energy. That can work too. There are many theories. How would you modify it? And they can explain what we observe today. And we can't tell the two apart. And so in order to understand which of these two is better explanation, we need data set like Rubin that does not exist today. And that's why we want to, to do this project. So we don't know the answer yet. That's what we know about dark matter, dark energy. Do wormholes exist in space? I don't know. <laughs> uh, wormholes are theoretical construct where you could go from one universe to parallel universe, but some people get excited about it, some scientists, and they like to talk about it. I'm more in the camp that says, if you cannot verify something experimentally, then we are already treading on the edge of science. I could postulate that there are other universes, but how can I check this when, by definition, what I can do is limited to my own universe? So I feel more comfortable making statements about what is measurable, what is verifiable in our own universe. And we will never, at least in the limits of my understanding of wormholes, it's a theoretical construct, and we will never be able, or at least in foreseeable future, will not be able to do anything experimentally about it. It's fun to watch Star Trek, and when they go from one point to the other one through wormhole, I'd like to have a wormhole. Like now, I could just transport myself to Sarajevo, have Burek or Chevapi, and then come back to Seattle and continue working. That'd be great, but I'm not aware how to do it. So I see no other questions. Uh, I must say, wow, and I guess this was better than any documentary I've watched <laughs> until now. It was really interesting, and thank you so much for, for giving your time to us. It, it was really precious. I must say this, was, this is precious. And I believe that everyone that participated in this webinar believes and thinks I, uh, the same thing. Thank you so much, Ivana. Thank you for inviting me. And anytime in the future, I would be happy to do something else and I'll keep an eye on foundation. And if anyone who is listening will have additional questions, just feel free to send me email. And good luck, Bosnia. <laughs>